Grand again. For the last several weeks on our series in stewardship, we have been speaking about personal stewardship. And uh, tonight, uh, I would like to begin um, the next portion of this three-part series. And understand, when I talk about parts, generally there are subparts to the parts that have subparts. Uh, just so that you all will know that it generally does not mean that it's three weeks and done. Uh, because it never ever seems to work out that it's three weeks and done. But this evening, uh, I, I would like to start this particular portion of this out on family stewardship by asking you all a question. What is a family? Because I, 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 what was that? People combined together. Because, I mean, I was looking at Kyle and far as I know, you're still not married, are you? See, I didn't think he was. Uh, which means that he's unattached to a lady and he got no kids. So him being singular, as in Kyle, uh, you have to ask yourself, well, does family stewardship then apply to him? I think it does. So, but... When you, when you look at this and somebody says to you, family, uh, I want you to understand that when this preacher's talking about family, it's more than just a mom and a dad and their children. Now, I believe that that is the family order that God has orchestrated and ordained in his word. I think that's the way that it is supposed to work. But I also believe that family tonight can be much bigger and broader than just whether or not that it's mom and dad and three kids. Trust me, I've got two kids that both got husbands and both got kids and then they bring them kids and their friends and by the time I'm done, I've got no room in my house and it's just Linda and I. I wonder how that always works. She says, we need more room. I'm thinking, why do we need more room? And then I remember how it was with mom and dad when we was kids. And our family was, we used the word extended family. And in God's house, we ought to be trying to find a way to extend our family. I told them Sunday night, uh, Sunday morning, I mentioned that there would be five churches that would be represented in that young people's uh, service up there. And that was an error in my statement. There were five congregations, it ended up being, I think there were nine uh, different congregations, but I said five congregations, but only one church. And it's important for us to understand. So if you've got your Bibles tonight and in just a little bit, I'll call out some scriptures and have you all look them up. But before I do that, I'd like us collectively to go to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. And uh, I, I want to, uh, this portion of this family stewardship, um, I, I want to, uh, emphasize to you that I believe that the examples that you set matter. Now, after you get to where you're going in the scripture, I'll let you get there, and then I'm going to say that again because I think it's important for you to get that. The example that you set matters. Whether or not that you are setting that example for somebody in your immediate family or somebody in your immediate environment. Some of us uh, have, how many of you all have jobs? Yeah, and the people you work with, what do they call them? Coworkers or family. They say it is your job family. And you look and you say, well, you know, here's the thing, I know it's hard for you all to believe this, but if you work a 40-hour work week, and most of us work more than 40, Leander, you work more than 40 hours a week? Yeah, like 40 hours the first three days and 40 hours the second three. Yeah, I, I, I have a work schedule like that. But what it ends up being is 
a lot of times you will spend more time with the people that you work with than you do with your family. And so consequently, you build relationships with them sometimes that are closer or as close as your normal family. And so what I want you to understand, whatever the environment that you're in, whether we are talking about your immediate family, whether we are talking about your circle of friends that are like family, or whether we are talking about your job family, I want you to understand the example that you leave matters. Now, let's read and see whether or not that uh, family stewardship, and oh, by the way, if, if God has made us a steward over our families, what's that mean about our families? Y'all remember? What was it? They belong to him. A steward is just somebody that takes care of somebody else's stuff. Now, in this case, the stuff that we are talking about is our families. So your family, whether it is your children, whether it is your circle, whatever, they don't really belong to you. They belong to God. Now, except for if it's grandkids, when it comes time for them to go home, they belong to their mom and their dad. It's like, would you take your youngins and go home? You know, because I know what it's like to feed them. So there are times that there are exceptions. Oh, wait, I told you in the beginning of all this, there's no exceptions and no exemptions, didn't I? <coughs> I hate that, didn't you all pay attention? So let's begin in First Chronicles chapter 29. If you're there, say amen, so I know you got it. Amen. Wonderful. I begin to read in verse 10. And it says it this way, Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation, and David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Now, I want you to see what happens here. David is now carrying on a conversation with God. Starting in verse 11, he says, Thine, O Lord, who is thine? What's that word mean? What was it? God? Yes. Here's the thing. Thine, if he says thine is the glory and the power forever, who does it belong to? What I want you to understand, this word denotes ownership of God. What he's about to say, God, this, what I'm about to tell you is already yours. Our examples matter. Watch what he says. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the, oops, underline that word next there. Now, remember, when I stop, you all stop. He says here that even the victory belongs to God. What's that mean? That means in family stewardship, if we're successful, yes, it's his. He still receives the glory. I say, and this is not, by the way, a false humility on my part. I say that everything that I have is because of God and Mrs. Freeman. God, because he blessed me, and Mrs. Freeman, because she took care of the bills. And God gave me Mrs. Freeman, so it's all his. No doubt. But I want you to understand, anything that I have ever had, that I have or ever will have, is because of God's blessing. It's his. He just allows me to take care of it for a little while. Now watch. He says here, Lord, this is yours, the greatness, the power, the glory, the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Now, what is all? Now, let me ask you, because you got to understand this. 
is your family. Now, think broader than just your children, your family, this church family, the church family that we had up on the screen a while ago because that's what we are. We are growing a church family. All of it, he says, all that is in the earth and in the heaven is his. So how much of it belongs to us? Nada. Zero. So that makes us stewards, does it not? Just want you to make sure you get that because here's the thing. <clears throat> Now, you're all going to love me, I know. When you realize that your family belongs to God, you may begin to treat them a little bit different. Oh, he didn't say that out like out loud, did he? Yeah, I did. Here's the thing. Watch what he says. He said, God, everything that's in the heaven and the earth, it's yours. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head. What's head? represent there he is number one he is the controller of all high and lifted up Isaiah said none higher now watch what he says verse 12 both riches and honor come of thee stop there let me ask you audience participation he says here when he's talking to God he said God Riches and honor come of thee. What does that mean? So any honor that we have comes from God. Any riches that we have. I was sitting back there in Cornerstone the other night and they was taking up the offering and somebody was sitting in front of me. They said, oops. I got to do what the pastor said. I have to give graciously. I know it was. I just didn't want to embarrass you. So I look in my wallet and I said, oh, so does the pastor. <laughs> the examples that we set matter in stewardship. Now watch. David said in verse 12, God, it, it all comes from you. And you reign over all of it. In your hand, he says, is power and might. And in thine hand, it is to make great and to give strength unto all. What he's saying there is, God, if I'm able to do anything, it's because of you. If I've got the strength to get up in the morning, it's because of you. If I've got the strength to go to work, if I do well at what I do, if I excel in life, everything that we have, you know, because there are folks, and, and, and I know they do, you know, they, they, they take credit. I got to tell you what, uh, most of the things that I do, I am not smart enough to do. Uh, I'm really not. But God, he sees fit to bless me and allow me. And so David said, it all comes from you. It's in your power to make us great and to give strength. Now watch, verse 13. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. I want you to stop right there. David has already told God it's from him. All power is his. He can do with David and with them as he will. And because of that, David says in 13, God, we are going to thank you and praise thy glorious name. Now, let me ask you, is this praising of God? And, and David, by the way, he does not say, I am going to look at it. He said, our God, we collectively as a people, David said. Now, let me ask you, is verse 13 only applicable when it goes good? How many of y'all have ever had it not go good? Now, if David says, God, it's in your power to make great 
and to allow to get riches. God said, I will raise up whom I will and I will bring down whom I will. And David said, in spite of all of that, God, we collectively, my family, David was speaking here, collectively, he said, all of these, God, we are going to praise you simply because you're God, no matter what. The examples that we live and lead make a difference. The people around us, if the only time that we are praising God is when it's going good, what are we telling our children to do when it goes bad? You see, what I, what I want you to understand is if it all belongs to him, he requires us to live and to lead an example that says he's God all the time. Now, let me, let me show you what David says here. Verse 14, he asks a question. He says, but... Now, understand, David has exalted God here. And then he asks a question in the midst of that. But who am I? And what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? Now, stop there for just a minute. And, and, and if, you, if, you're, if you're paraphrasing that, or as I would say, if you put that in hillbilly terms so that you can understand it, what is David really saying there when he says, God, who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? Okay, that's a part of it. I think he was humbling. I think he's really humbled here. I, I mean, what was it? Okay, so if he's saying, who are we, humbly, what's our purpose, that we are able to give back, what is he really asking God? That's the word I was looking for. God who am I that you have blessed me or entrusted me? Going back now to stewardship. David said, God, why have you blessed me so magnificently that I am able to give back to what you've given me? And I'm telling you, if we look at what we have I, I, I look at, and, and I got to tell you what, did I tell you that we have an absolutely beautiful, beautiful building, but we have a gorgeous church? Somebody called me today, and they said to me, preacher, you have angels in your church. Glory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They said, no, preacher, you have got some of the most giving, gracious people in your church. And I'm going, wow. And then I got to thinking, God, who am I that you have blessed me to have those kinds of people surrounding me in my church? Because that's what David is. David looked around and he looked at the majesty of God and he looked simply and by, he, he is, by the way, getting ready to give to God the things that were necessary for Solomon to build the temple. And David simply says, God, who am I and who is this people that you've surrounded me with that you allow us the privilege of maintaining what's already yours? Now, let, let me look at how he says this because I, I, I want to hone this down so you understand the importance of this. He says that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort. Now, 
What's the word willingly mean? Without hesitation, who said what? Freely given? Not forced? Wanting to? Wanting to? Now, <clears throat> let me ask you a question. Can you, can you willingly offer when you don't want to? You can offer, but, but you see what David, he says to God here, God, there is in our people, there is no hesitation, God. Whatever you need, we want to give it to you because you're God. Now, let me stop here and tell you that if we do what we do as a church, because it's what the pastor thinks we ought to do, we are not giving it to God willingly. We're doing it because the pastor says that it's a... Now, if the pastor says it's a good idea, we probably ought to, you know, either throw him out or follow what he says. That's why he's the pastor. Now, that doesn't mean he's a dictator. I got enough smarts to know that God has surrounded me with a lot of great people. And uh, generally, before I implement, institute, or whatever other words that you might want to throw out there, I generally bounce it off of a lot of people just to see what their reactions are. And then, hesitantly, I lead because I'm learning. But what I want you to understand is David said, God, what we are about to do, we are doing because you're God. No other reason than because you're God. And David said, God, who am I? When he looked at himself in retrospect to God's majesty, David looked and he said, God, you're going to let me do what? Now, let me ask you all a question. And, and, and I know, and, and I tell you that the examples that we live matter. The examples that we leave matter. So let me ask you, has God allowed you the ability to live and to leave examples. If he's made you stewards over anything, he has. The other day, Noah came downstairs and uh, he was supposed to read, is it this Sunday? Last Sunday. He's supposed to read in junior church. And Cassie asked him, said, have you practiced? He said, no. He said, it's just little church. You know what I'm grateful of? Cassie looked at Noah and she said, you know that pastor has said that the little church is as important as the big church. Up the stairs he went, he changed his clothes, he put on a tie, and he grabbed his Bible. Example. Example. I, I, I don't, and, and, and I, I want, please do not misunderstand me. To me, that is part of who we are. And the legacy that we are trying to leave our young people is it's all right in the world in which we live to worship God and to praise God and to rely on God and to live for God and to be excited about God and not to be ashamed of God in a world that is trying to get us to get our children to be silent. We're trying to teach them that it's all right to lift up their voices. But we must do that by example. And David said, God, and, and, and I, and I know when I talk about things like this, people say, well, you know, that preacher just wants us to do more in the church. I do. It takes people. I'm praying God will give us people. May I tell you? I might as well. Uh, the examples that we live and leave are important. Y'all gonna love me? You need to start praying. I want to split our junior church into two groups. 
Do you know what that means? That means the six or seven teams that I've got now are not enough. I need about 10. 10 more would be great. But I need about 10 anyway. Because if I had 10, I could split them into two groups and you'd only have to miss church once every five weeks. If I have 12 groups, you'd only have to miss church once every six weeks. And, it, and the beat goes on and on and on and on and on. But it's important to me. If I could find a way to clone myself, I love to be with the children. I like to teach them. I get right down in the floor with them. Because I love them. And God has given us that. And so I want you all to pray. Because I really need people. Not just you people. Because, you know, we can wear out the people that we got. But, I, you know, I got to tell you, and that's not just there, um, because for me, I, I have a vision. Can I share it with you? Because I look at what David said to God. He said, God, who am I that you give me this? And now I'm allowed to give it back to you when it was yours in the first place. I got to tell you, I, I want some of our teenagers leading worship in junior church. <laughs> Go figure. I do. You know why? Here's why. I'm still talking about this same passage of scripture. I've not lost my mind. I know you all think I have. But I've not lost my mind. I want, I want some of our teenagers to get to the point. Now, I don't want them back there just singing so that they're not in service. That's not what I'm talking about. I want them leading worship. In order to lead worship, you have to be able to worship. It's not about singing for me because I can't. But I can lead worship because I can feel the spirit and know what direction God's taken the church. That's leading worship. I can tell Kyle in the middle of something, hey, get me this song because that's what God says. But anyhow, I want our teenagers leading our children because when I was in the fourth grade, I couldn't wait to get in the fifth grade because when I got to be in the fifth grade, I got to be the, the patrol guy with the flag and the belt and the badge. And man, it was tough. And so when we was in fourth grade, we couldn't wait to get in fifth grade because we knew we got to be that. I want my children to look up to my teenagers so they cannot wait until it's their turn to lead worship in junior church. And then guess what? I want our teenagers looking at our worship team not being able to wait until they can graduate, get into the service, and get up front and be a part of that worship service. You know what that is? That's living and leaving an example. The first time that one of these young fellas come up and they say to me, Pastor... It's my time. Now, you all might think I may have a hard time with that. I probably won't. Unless, of course, they get up and then don't do nothing. Then I have to set them down and teach them when they say it's their time, it's God's time, and they have to preach. But I won't, I'll be excited about that because I want them to look at me and say, I want to be like that. Not because of me but because of what God has done in my life. And you see what happens is we are leaving a continual example and living a continual example that instead of our young people, when they get 16 and 17 years old, they go out in the world because there's nothing in the church for them. I mean, you, you talk to people. When our young folks are 16, 17, 18 years old, they are making decisions that are going to impact their whole lives. Do I go to college or do I don't? Do I, I get married or do I don't? Do I have kids or do I don't? And some of them already do. And very rarely is God a part of that equation. And then when we get them back when they're 35 or 40, they've been through abusive situations They've been through addictions. They've been through divorces. They've got children that are everywhere and their lives are torn apart and we have to try to find a way to put them back together. I want to minister to our children before they're broken. 
and keep them in God's, I want them to have a reason to want to come to church. That's what God, that's the legacy that David is. God, why in the world did you bless me with this? And then allow me to give it back to him. You know what I want? I want to be able, and I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know when it's going to work. Maybe the Lord's going to come back before then. But, but the first time that one of these young fellas, and, and they are the other week, I think Noah and Ben were still going at it. One of them's talking about being the pastor and the other one being the associate pastor. Now, they want a McDonald's in the church and we're going to have to work on that. You know, it can be at the other end of the building, I guess. But the first time that one of them young fellas are actually called of God to preach the gospel and stand and do that, I am probably going to find me a closet somewhere where nobody else can hear me and I am probably going to have me a hillbilly spit fit. <laughs> because I can then say to God, God, I did my part, I left the example, and God, somebody followed it. I ain't got to tell you what, I, I, I want you to understand Somebody, whether you realize it or not, somebody in your family is following you. You say, well, I don't know if they're, you know, they're not paying any attention to me, preacher. Yeah, they might. I just wonder what it is. David said here, God, who am I and what is my people? Understand, David took ownership. <laughs> Yo, I might as well go off the deep end. How, how many of you all love God? That's easy, isn't it? How many of you all love the church? This one. Okay, I appreciate that. So when, when, when I look at this, David said, God, who am I? And what is my people? He took ownership. May I tell you, take ownership of your church. It is not mine. It belongs to him. And he made us all stewards over it. Now listen. We are stewards over all of it. Not just the parts we want to be stewards over. Ooh. Don't you hate that? I got to tell you what. I was out playing in the traffic before church. Literally. Literally. I went out to the mailbox to get the mail. I opened up the side of the mailbox. The wind blew through the mailbox and blew open the other side and the wind went and so did the mail. I'm, I, and by the way, I want to tell you it was junk mail. Here's why that's important. You say, what in the world has that got to do with anything? Well, let me tell you, I was out there chasing it. The cars would go this way and run over it and the wind would take it that way from the cars and about the time that the cars got by, the wind would pick it up and take it that way. And I had to keep looking to see if there was more cars coming and I finally, there's one piece. I finally chased that thing down and I look at it and I said, I can't even stink and believe it. I'm talking myself out there in the middle of 23. I'm looking at it. I say, I cannot stink and believe it. It's junk mail after all of that. But let me tell you what God said. God said, you didn't know it was junk mail when you was chasing it. A piece of mail, God, really? You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna teach me something with a piece of mail? We don't know what the outcome is going to be. So we can't elect to do just the things that are pleasing to us. Sometimes what we're going to do is chase junk mail. We don't know that when we're chasing it. Sometimes some of the, the things that we do, I, I was with my pastor this morning. I, I, I took advantage of a, a little bit of time and... Uh, I took him to breakfast. Him and I don't get to spend much time together anymore. 
uh, very few times since we've opened this church have him and I actually got to sit down and, and have a quality conversation. And I was thankful that the time that we spent together this morning, my phone never rang, never vibrated. I'm not fussing. I don't mind it when it does that. But I was thankful this morning that it, that it didn't. And we, we was talking with a, a young man at the end of our, our time together. And we was talking about, and I knew this young fella. He, I say young fella, he's my age. But we was talking about how long we've done what we've done. And, and uh, Pastor Baker spoke up. And he said, you know, because I said I'd been a mechanic for almost 40 years now. And Don's been a salesman for, for 29 years. And, and uh, uh, Brother Baker spoke up. And he said, well, he said, fellas, he said, I've been a pastor for 42 years. And Don said, boy, he said, you about got to have, and Don's not saved. Don said, he said, man, he said, you about got to have passion and compassion for that job, don't you? And pastor said, well, and you know, because he's worse than I am. He sees an open door. Somebody tries to close it. He doesn't just put his foot in. He just kind of steps like this. Won't let him. Don opened the door. So pastor thought, well, it's open. I might as well step in at both feet. And he did. And he said, well, he said, I'll be honest with you. He said, finding people today that have a pastor's heart is exceedingly difficult to do. He said, people want to preach, but he said, nobody wants to go to the hospitals anymore. He said, now, I don't like to go to the hospital, he said, but it's necessary. You know what that is? That's doing the things that, and, and I got to, I tell people, and I'm not fussing, I'm just telling you what God has, he has blessed us with and made us stewards over. I tell people, God has a sense of humor. If you all don't like to laugh, you're in a world of trouble. God's got a sense of humor. I know that because God called me to be a pastor and I hate hospitals. When I was a child, they didn't think I was coming home from the hospital. Then when I was in sixth grade, I caught spinal meningitis and rheumatic fever at the same time. They wasn't sure I was coming home from the hospital then either. And then the doctors rightly said, they told my mom he'll never be normal. <laughs> Proper diagnosis, doc. I don't like hospitals. I don't like to go to them when I'm sick. But I believe God's got a sense of humor because God puts me in hospitals more than I care to be there. But I'm okay with that. Because God has allowed us to be a steward over my people. And we have to be willing to chase the mail sometimes. It's not always about preaching. And you all know how I am about preaching. I love to preach. But the preaching portion of being a pastor is a very small, small portion of what I do. You say, what in the world has that got to do? Because whatever it is that you're doing, sometimes it seems like a very small portion of it is significant. But may I tell you that every example that you live and leave is significant to somebody. David said he took ownership. He said, God, who am I and what is my people that you would allow us to do this. And so we have to take ownership. Now, let me broaden this out from the church because we have to take ownership of our workplaces. They're ours while we're there. It, uh, it, it, maybe it ain't. Let's see. How many of y'all got a job again? Whose job is it? Yeah, well, yeah, all that we have belongs to God, but... But if, if Shad has a job, that job does not, it's not Gary's job. It's Shad's job. He would say, it's my job. It's my job, whatever it is. Well, it's my job, whatever it is. When we have a church, it's my job, whatever it is. You see, it's an amazing thing. God said, I searched for a man to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. In other words, God said, there's a hole and I need somebody to fill it 
And then you know what he told him? He said, I searched for a man to stand in the gap, make up the hedge. And then he said, but I found none. Now, I got to tell you, it'll be a sad time in the churches if God said, I searched for a man and I found none. I found none. I, 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 if, if God says, I, I searched for a dad and I didn't find any, or I searched for a mom and I didn't find any, or I searched for somebody to, and I didn't find, I'm telling you, that's, that's not good. I, I want to be like David. David was excited. He was excited for him and for his people. Now, he asked the question. He says, God, who are we? Who is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee and of thine own have we given thee. Look at the terminology there. He said, of thine own, we have given thee. So what he was saying is, <laughs> if, 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 because I, I really, I, I, I will use Shad as an example. First time I ever seen that boy eat, I thought, Really? That was when he went for the second plate. When he went for the third plate, I'm going, really? Hi. But, so I've learned that <clears throat> if I'm going to invite <clears throat> Shad and Cassie over for dinner, I want him to bring the dinner. Because <coughs> if I'm going to give him dinner, I'd rather give him what was his already. Because it's easier on me. Look at what David, I know y'all saying, that's a ridiculous example, preacher. No, it's really not. Look at what David said. He said, God, how is it that you allow us to be blessed for giving you what we took from you to give to you? Because that's how it's worded. He said, we have given you, God, what was yours already. Now, if I'm going to give Shad $10, I just assume first he'd give me 20. Then when I give him 10, it don't feel so bad. <laughs> I'm going to have to do that math. I like that pretty well. Unfortunately, he's got a secretary treasurer that's a lot like mine. She keeps better track of his money than he does. I'd have a better chance of talking him out of it than I would her. I'm sure of that. But what David said, basically, in hillbilly terms, he said, God, this does not make sense. You are allowing me and blessing me for giving you something that was yours already. So he said, I took it from you, God, and then I gave it back to you, and then you bless me for it? God, that don't make no sense. That's what he's saying when he said, who am I? God, why do you care enough about me that you allow me? I got to tell you what, I'm still trying to figure out why that God, hey, let me ask you all a question. How many of you all believe that you're here because it's where God wants you to be? Have you asked, just asked yourself, why in the world, God, did you let me be part of church that was so special? Oh, did that preacher just say that about his church? No. Nope. You still ain't got it. It ain't his church. It's his church. And if you're a part of his church, it's special. I ain't talking about just this. But have you ever wondered what David did? He said, God, I look around and I look at how you bless me. And then God, you let me give you part of what you gave me and give it back. And then you call it good. And then you bless me for giving it to you. The examples that we live and leave make a difference. They change things. Now watch what he says. He tells him here, what we have given thee is thine, it, it's yours already, God. In verse 15, he said, we're, we are strangers before thee, sojourners as were our fathers. Our days on the earth are as a shadow and there is none abiding. O Lord, our God, all of this store that we have prepared to build thee a house for thine holy name cometh of thine own hand and is all thine own. Now, 
what David is saying to God is, God, we, we are about to build you a church out of all the stuff that you've blessed us with. And I said all of that to get to this because I want you to understand what you do, the example that you live and leave makes a difference. Here's why it makes a difference. David never got to experience the building of God's temple. But his son did. And you see, all David did was left an example to Solomon. Watch what he says. God, in verse 17, I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and hast pleasure in uprightness. And as for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all of these things. And now have I seen with joy thy people, which are present here to offer willingly unto thee. Now, what David is saying is God, I'm looking and all these people feel just like me. They're here to offer. But now watch what he says. He says in verse 18, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the hearts of thy people and prepare their heart unto thee. What he said here is, God, don't ever, 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 ever let your people lose sight of this truth. What is that truth? That everything that we have belongs to God and what we do with it makes a difference. Now watch. Here's why I say this. Verse 19. David asked God and give unto Solomon, my son, a perfect heart to keep thy commandments, thy testimonies and thy statutes and to do all these things. What things? Build the temple. Everything that David had said and done to this point was for a purpose. And what he said is, God, would you give my son the heart to fulfill what I can? Let me tell you again why what we have matters. I've told you about our church I believe that everything that has been done to this point, all of the blessings of God to this point, is God putting everything in place for what he is about to do. Now that statement will be just as true next year as it is this year. When I am gone, if the Lord should tarry, that statement will be just as true then as it is now as long as we do not lose this truth. David said, God, would you in my son? Now, let me tell you again why I believe that what we do, the examples that we live in. When I, <clears throat> I went the other night up there to that youth service, and I guess I never really give it a thought uh, until Cassie said so. Because, you know, I'm a preacher and you know, preachers normally are looking at the big picture. Sometimes we don't see all of the intricate things because we're looking at, and I'm looking at all this. And uh, <clears throat> they had run me out of the back seat, brought me up front, and then I got up and gave up my front seat, then didn't have a seat. And Cassie said, Dad, she said, I think you ought to sit right down here in between your grandchildren so that they can experience church with you. And I thought, man, they experience church with me all the time. No, they don't. They experience church with their pastor, not their papal. And you know what I... I want them to know that their papal and their pastor is the same. I'm not any different when I'm sitting in the pew than I am when I'm in the pulpit. The word of God is still precious to me even when I'm not preaching it. The songs still move my heart even when I'm not singing them. 
the church is still vital to me even when it's not mine. Nothing changes. And I sat down there and I had, uh, I had Noah on my right and I had Ben sitting there beside of me. And then part of the time I had Jake either on my lap between my legs or beside of me or in my arms. That booger's heavy when you hold him a while. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you he is. But I, 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 I had uh, Noah and Ben and Jake and uh, April, although she's a little older than them. And then on down the way was Levi. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm thinking... Man, I, I'm restricted here. Because, you know, when, when the folks in the church started shouting, uh, Jacob went. So I got ready to shout. I just put my hands over his ears. <laughs> but I never thought about it like what Cassie said. About how important it is for my, because my children know how I am. They seen me in church for years when I wasn't the pastor and wasn't the guy that was preaching and it really didn't make any difference to me. Because I'm the same guy no matter which pew I sit in, I'm always on the edge of my pew just thinking maybe if God had just let me. I'm always looking for, you know, a way in. Sunday night, they started singing that song. I'm telling you, the Lord come by in, in my pew. I know he had to come past him children to get to me because they was all the way around me. But I weren't no different. When the preacher started preaching and he preached out of one of my favorite passages, well, he preached out of several of my favorite passages, but one in particular, 73rd Psalm, uh, he started reading verses one and two and I was quoting them while he was reading them. And then he said, you know, David, he was looking around. And he said, until, I said, verse 17 and 18, he said, until I went into the house of the Lord and I was quoting it before he read it. That's just what I do. And I'm not bragging about me. But what it showed them children is that the word of God is precious to their papa and their pastor. The example that I, I, I'm, I I've got, I've got a, a little leather bound Bible that Cassie has already laid claim to because it was my first preaching Bible. The pages are falling out of it, literally. Most of them are stuck together where I've preached all over them, wept in them. I'm not ashamed of that because in between every one of them pages that are stuck together, if you peel them open, there's a message in there. Maybe one of these days, one of my grandsons is going to oh, grab a hold of that book. One of them messages in there is going to come alive to him like it did for their papaw. They're not going to be ashamed when somebody tells them in junior church that it's all right to worship God and it's all right to sing praises to God and it's all right to read the Bible one of these days, one of them might pick up that book and open it. They might be looking at it and saying, wonder why Papa highlighted that or underlined that or circled that. They might begin to read it. The same God that spoke to me might speak to them. The Spirit may come on them. They might stand up in a little block building when nobody else is around and read St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 49 and 50, that says, How is it that you sought me? Wished you not that I know that I must be about my Father's business? And for an hour and 20 minutes, preach about what God's business is. I, I'm telling you, I hope God grants me the privilege of watching that happen to my grandsons or to one of my son-in-laws or both of my son-in-laws. I don't know. 
if this one ever thinks he called to preach, I'm just going to kill him and send him direct. <laughs> Our services is only an hour and a half long. It takes him that long to read a verse. What I'm telling you is, David said, God, out of everything that you have blessed me with, would you put in my son, in my children, God, in my people, don't ever allow this to leave their hearts that even as their king and their leader and their father, I was not afraid to give it all back to God because it was his anyway. I am telling you, that's called graceful giving and trusting God with the results. That's how we have to be as a church. The Bible said that God loves a cheerful and the word translated there literally means hilarious giver. And I'm not just talking about his money that he loaned to you. I'm talking about everything that we are, everything that we do. I, 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 Sunday night when I was sitting there, I, I didn't realize at the time because I'm surrounded by kids and, and, I, and I, I, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, uh, if I move, <laughs> you know, which one of them am I going to, you know, have to move for me to move. But I got to tell you, when it come time to move, it didn't keep me in my seat because I got on my feet, children and all. <laughs> didn't matter. But I said that to say this, I didn't realize when Cassie asked me that until I was coming down the road later, how vital and important that was. My grandchildren don't get to experience that. Well, Tori does sometimes when I pick her up and carry her while I'm preaching. But that's still her pastor. That's not her papaw. What I want you to understand, out of everything that David said to God, all of it, the most vital thing that David said is, God, what you have blessed me with and my understanding of that, God, allow me to instill that in the hearts of my people and my son and don't ever let it leave them. I think we ought to have a, if, if, if somebody told me one time that if a pastor is successful, the church will take on the personality of the pastor. And I, I don't know if that's a truism or not, but I hope that it is. Because if the church takes on the personality of the pastor, then we'll be a whole church full of pushers. I don't push very patiently sometimes, and I know that. But it's because I feel like that we're running out of time. The examples that we live and the examples that we leave makes a difference. It makes a difference. How we teach our children. And I, and, and I told somebody last week, and I'm going to tell you all now. I want you to pray. Going back to personal stewardship now. Personal stewardship is still what God has blessed you with. And you need to ask God, God, what you've given me, how can I give it back to you? How do you want me to apply that? Family stewardship, one of the things that we need to understand is God has given us something and it ought to be in our hearts to turn around and give it back to God because we don't understand why God has chose to bless us the way that he has. I, 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 I tell people that, that I would not trade what I do now for the highest office in the land. I believe to be called to preach the gospel and to be privileged to be a pastor is the greatest calling that God can place on a man's life and the greatest purpose that a man can have on the face of the earth. More than the president of the United States of America and I wouldn't want his job. I really wouldn't. And I, not about politics. What I, but what I am saying is the job of the President of the United States for me is not as important as the pastors that stand in the pulpit Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and speak to the people about the separation between an eternity in heaven or hell and teach that to our children. 
I don't ever want to lose that passion for that. David said, God, I don't understand why you've blessed me the way you have, why you've blessed my, I, I got to tell you, and, and I say this, and, and, and again, I want you to understand, this is not about me and or my family. I only use them as an example because they're mine. It's what God gave me to be a steward over. But I am grateful that as I stand here and tell you tonight that I tried to be the best steward over what God gave me and I didn't do it all right. I made mistakes. But tonight as I stand before you, my daughter and her husband are serving in God's house and they love the Lord. My other daughter and her husband are serving in God's house and they love the Lord. And both of them are bringing their children up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And their children love the Lord and they love the church. And so Papa's passion has made it to two more generations. I don't know what God's going to do there. But I want them to understand that dad was not ashamed. The Apostle Paul said, and, and I'll close with this. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. He said, for as much as in me is, I am now ready to preach the gospel. I'm not ashamed of it, he said, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all that believe. The Jew, the Greek also, but it is the power of God unto salvation. I believe tonight that God has entrusted this fellowship of believers with a dispensation of time to preach the gospel. And whether we are preaching it from the pews or whether we are preaching it from the pulpit, we must take advantage of what God has allowed us to be a part of. Wherever we have family stewardship, family simply means more than just you. Everywhere you go, you are responsible for your family, whoever they are. However you reach them, the examples that you live and leave. Good friend of mine, well, I guess at this point in acquaintance, because I very rarely ever got to see him in the latter years. Preacher friend of mine went home be with the Lord this morning. And uh, they said that Brother Donnie went in and Brother Joe said, I, I just want to go home. I'm ready. Said Donnie had prayer with him. About 10 or 15 minutes later, Joe took a deep breath and he exhaled it, he closed his eyes, and he slipped through eternity's door. I said that to say this, all of Brother Joe's life that I knew him, and that's as many years as I've been saved, all of his life that I knew him, the one thing that I knew about Joe was he was a preacher of the gospel. That's what he did. He left an example behind. He lived an example for others to see and others to follow. And as a church, as a family, as a pastor, as a papal, I want to do the same thing. I want to leave the same example. I want to live the same example. We can make a difference. We need to be willing sometimes to chase the mail. When we catch it, we say, what in the world was all of that for? I don't know, but I believe God has given us a purpose. I don't want to lose passion for that purpose, whatever it is, whatever it is. So let us bow our head.